Okay, hi everyone. Today we have another breach that I really want to unpack and discuss. This time it involves the Indian government. And uh, I don't mean one organization within the Indian government. I'm talking about really a huge breach that spans across multiple different state-owned entities. So in this video, what I really want to do is just first of all outline just exactly what happened and what was discovered and the vulnerabilities that were reported. I then want to go through the step-by-step -step play that the attackers took. And at the end of that, I want to take a step back and just look at what the high level it is, because the high level information we can use and translate that into our own organization. And then the last step, I just want to talk about prevention. I'm not going to go into huge detail uh, because <laughs> cybersecurity prevention I can talk about for hours, uh, but let's just tackle some tools and uh, some methods that we can use to prevent, uh, to prevent this particular attack and attack path. So let's get stuck in. So what actually happened? Well, this is another white hat attack from the group Sakura Samurai. Now, this attack was uh, spurred on because of the responsible vulnerability disclosure program that the Indian government has. This is called the NCIIPC. Now, using this responsible vulnerability disclosure program, they were able to legally attack and try and breach the Indian government, which they were able to do. In total, a lot of information was found, including 35 separate sets of exposed credential peers, uh, three instances of very sensitive file disclosure, five exposed private RSA keys, 13,000 uh, PII records, dozens of sensitive police reports and forensic reports discovered, remote code execution on a financial server, and then in the end, a session hijacking of an application running on that financial server. So a lot to unpack. So let's just start by looking at the initial step. Well, step one is establishing a perimeter. Now the responsible vulnerability disclosure program that the Indian government had outlined a list of domains that were covered under this. So using this, they established their first list of targets, you know, their perimeter. Now the next step, is to try and enrich this, really discover as, as much subdomains as possible. So to do this, they use two tools, namely chaos and subfinder. And this really allowed them to enumerate each of these domains and find all the possible subdomains that were uh, listed under this. This gives us the widest possible perimeter. This led us to the first interesting information that we actually discovered. And this is the police and forensics reports that were discovered in an open file directory on a subdomain that belonged to the Satara Police Department. Now, I would still call this very much the reconnaissance stage of the attack. So finding sensitive information in this stage really kind of uh, shows that it's probably going to be some interesting stuff that we're going to find as we go through the next steps. Okay, so the second step that they took well, they began to search their newly established perimeter, including all the subdomains for assets. What we're really trying to do here is map out just the list of targets. To do this, there's a number of freely available tools used. First one being a mass. Uh, this is to I try and identify a lot of uh, kind of assets and map that out. We use Nuclei, which was to try and identify any vulnerabilities, particularly in infrastructure, DIR search, and then Rust scan for some port scanning. So using these tools, we can really uh, transition from our perimeter into our kind of map of our assets that uh, is going to be targeted in this. Takes us on to the next step. What's the next step of the attack? Well, this is to identify low hanging fruit, or what I'm calling low hanging fruit. So if we take all the assets that we just mapped out, one easy way to try and penetrate a foothold into the organization, make that significant initial access, get lateral movement in, is to try and discover if there's any secrets exposed within this perimeter. So what are secrets? These are things like credentials, API keys, security certificates, really anything that's gonna provide me access into a system, service, or infrastructure. Now, in uh, this step, uh, or the attackers found 
quite a large number of this sensitive information. So we're gonna run through this really quick, uh, but I won't go into too much detail. So first what they found was 10 Git directories that were accessible re remotely, but on the client side that had hard-coded credentials within them. These belong to a number of different organizations within the Indian government. They were also able to find 23 exposed .env files. .env files are environment variables. These are very regularly used to uh, set up the environment of an application, so often contain sensitive information. These make them a very high value target for attackers. It's something that they know to look out for. .env files. In this case, 23 exposed uh, env files belong to a large number of different uh, state-owned organizations. Moving along, we find our first lot of PII. Now, this was actually exposed uh, in an SQL dump. Now, an SQL dump is essentially a backup of a MySQL database. And this particular SQL dump was from the West Bengal Medical Service Corporation application. This is a web application and the SQL dump comes from anyone that submitted a contact form on this application. So quite sensitive information. Next, we have exposed client bash files. So uh, the, the bash or command line, people often don't think that this is actually something that might, a record might be created of. Again, high value targets for attackers that they know to look out for. So in this case, there was three instances uh, of the bash history files that were discovered, two of which contained hard-coded credentials uh, into MySQL databases. Next, we have five exposed RSA keys. Now these keys were giving access to servers. So again, very critical that these are private. Uh, these belong to five different organizations within the, the government and would have granted significant access uh, for attackers to penetrate deeper into the infrastructure, into the organizations. <sighs> Almost getting to the end. We have uh, another SQL dump, this time with 13,000 uh, personal records on here. This one from the government's youth uh, the in, uh, Indian Youth Employment Program. And finally, uh, we, there was uh, one instance of an exposed uh, WP underscore admin .php file. This is a WordPress application file, uh, so could have led to takeover of a government-owned website. So I, I want to point out now that I've come to the end of all this low-hanging fruit information that we've discovered. The idea behind this attack was not to penetrate as far as they can, to access as many possible systems as they can. The idea is to establish an attack path, identify the vulnerabilities of that attack path, and then report back to the Indian government. Because of this, all of these low-hanging fruits, or the majority of them, weren't actually uh, used. They didn't access into the databases. They found the PII from SQL dumps, but they didn't find it from actually going into the databases themselves. So, obviously, we don't need to use too much imagination to know that if this is a malicious actor, okay, now we have a huge number of different attack paths spanning from the low-hanging fruit. We can encrypt data and use it for ransom. We can launch spear phishing campaigns. We can squat inside systems. We can try and penetrate deeper into infrastructure. Uh, we can try and exploit some applications. Uh, a lot of different paths. For this, uh, for the purpose of this, not necessary. Now, this brings us to the next step of the attack, step four, which is to scan our assets for vulnerabilities. Particular, particularly, we're looking for infrastructure vulnerabilities. And to do this, the attackers used a tool called Nuclei, which we've discussed previously, and they identified a, a number of interesting assets that were potentially vulnerable to an exploit. But they decided to focus their attention on one such asset that was of particular and uh, kind of uh, significance, which was a uh, financial server belonging to the government of Kerala. So needless to say that having a financial server with vulnerabilities is very <laughs> compelling to attackers to say the least. So the attention was then moved to try and exploit this and again, prove their methodology more than anything else. So how do they do this? Well, this particular server was running a vulnerable version of a Tomcat Apache server. And this was actually vulnerable to a known exploit that allowed remote code execution. So being able to just download that exploit 
which had been disclosed, they ran it and successfully were able to see that they could execute code remotely on this financial server. Obviously a significant win for the attackers. After they had successfully proven this, we moved on to the final step of this attack. And this final step is to try and transition from infrastructure to an application. Now again, they've limited their focus uh, as narrowly as possible, again, just to prove the methodology. And this was to target the main application running on this financial server. To do this, they were able to really access deep into the, the server and find a list of authenticated users and their session IDs. The application in, in question was a Java application and Java applications very commonly uh, use a J session ID cookie to authenticate users. Because they had access into the server and were able to see a list of authenticated uh, users, the attackers randomly selected a user took their uh, ID and created a new session cookie, a J session ID cookie. After creating this cookie, they were simply able to access the web application as if they were a correctly authenticated user and be able to perform all the tasks that any successfully authenticated user could do within the panel. Now, if this was a real attack, then you would probably want to try and find uh, specific users with the highest uh, level rights, super admins, and access their session IDs. In this case, they just selected a random person because again, the purpose was to prove methodology and not actually cause damage. But they were able to take over and perform all the tasks that any, uh, any authenticated user could do, which is the final step of the attack. Okay, so we've come to the end, and uh, as you can see, there was a huge amount of vulnerabilities within this. That's partly because we're looking at such a wide perimeter, but I think in total, there was a 34 page report with vulnerabilities that was presented to the Indian government. But if we take just a step back here, what we can really see is a very clear path that the attackers took. And this is interesting because we can take this exact same path on our own organizations we can see how we would have held up against this exact attack by Sakura Samurai. So let's just take a look at that without all the information. What was the methodology used? Well, step one, they established a perimeter. They did this using the Responsible Vulnerability Disclosure Program, creating a list of domains, but it's easy enough to do this for an organization. All the domains your organization knows, uh, it could be all your employees and their publicly accessible information, maybe their Git repositories. The first step is really establishing that perimeter and then using that to enrich it to find the most amount of information we can. We're talking about subdomains, directories, file directories, anything that is exposed publicly. Now, once we have that mapped out, we come to the second stage of the attack, which is to try and identify all the assets. We want to identify servers, we want to identify our Git repositories, really anything that we can focus our attention on. The next step is to identify the low hanging fruit. How can I penetrate into the organization deeper with the least amount of sophistication? Well, a good way to do that is with credentials. And if we have a wide perimeter and we've identified a lot of publicly accessible assets, chances are we're going to be able to find some credentials within this that's going to give us some lateral movement. Next step, let's take our assets and scan them for vulnerabilities. Now, in this attack that we just presented, it was infrastructure that was really targeted. And this will be true in any attack, but we can also look at applications. We can look at the dependencies of those applications. Simple enough to discover what dependencies an application uses and if those dependencies in the current versions are, are vulnerable to any exploits. The last step is we want to transition. Our ultimate goal is to take over an application or get as high level as we can authenticated within an organization. To do this, we can move from infrastructure that we've compromised into applications. And this gives us the most amount of control. If we can penetrate into an organization and take control over both their infrastructure and their applications, well, then happy days if you're a bad guy. So, Let's now talk about prevention. Now, the, the good news is, is that, well, a lot of this we can stop. We can clean up a lot of our perimeter to make sure that 
all that low hanging fruit uh, isn't available. Really reduce the number of attackers that would be able to penetrate the system to as close to zero as possible. Although we all know in cybersecurity, zero risk is not possible. But let's start by identifying our own perimeter. It's what the attackers did and it's what we should do <laughs> within cybersecurity teams and organizations. Identify all the assets that we have and by start by doing that, we need to identify our perimeter really have that. We can use a couple of tools for this. We can use the same tools that the attackers used. Git Guardian can also help establish a perimeter outside of your company. So there are risks such as employees' Git repositories. We really wanna make our perimeter as wide as possible. And there's some cool tools that we can do that. Now, the next step is to scan this perimeter for the low hanging fruit. Things like credentials. So Git Guardian is a great service that's free for most teams that can identify credentials uh, within, a, within your Git repositories. But on top of that, we also probably want to have in place some good credential management if we find anything. Consider using something like HashiCorp Vault. It's infrastructure heavy, it requires a bit of setup, but there are other tools available if we're in a smaller team. We also want to make sure that we have a mitigation strategy in place. What happens when a credential leaks? Very often, if it's in a Git repository, it's deleted and forgotten about, but attackers know that the Git history contains a trove of information. Even the batch history was used in this case. So it's not good enough just to delete something and hope no one finds it. We need to really clean this out. So what's the mitigation strategy that we have in place if a credential is leaked? Well, it needs to be rotated. Who's the people that do that and who owns each credential? or each secret. These are things that really we want to have mapped out as part of our mitigation strategy. And what's the next one? Well, patch vulnerabilities. I know it's simple and it's something that <laughs> you'll hear forever. Patch regularly, not just our applications, but our infrastructure, our dependencies. We can use great tools for this. Nuclei was used to discover uh, vulnerabilities in this, uh, in this attack, but consider Sneak, great tool, again, free for most uh, organizations, can identify vulnerabilities in your application's dependencies. Really important steps to take. There's a number of other tools that we can use um, and runtime tools that we can use to try and identify this, these attacks. But I don't want to go too much down a rabbit hole. But what I will say is that well, if you're wondering how you should secure your application or organization, or if you're wondering how it would stand up from an attack, well, here's an attack path and a methodology that we've outlined. Why don't you consider using this exact methodology and the tools that we use to try and penetrate into your organization, see if you have any low hanging fruit, see if you have infrastructure vulnerabilities that can be exploited, see if you can move into your application. It's not the only way, but I think it's a really clear way that you can make progress into trying to assess whether your organization or application is secure. Well, that's it for today. If you want me to uh, analyze another particular breach or go into detail about something else, just let me know in the comments. Uh, I'm always happy to have a discussion. Or if you disagree with anything that I said here today, then also let me know. Uh, I'll be uh, fascinated to hear your thoughts.